Hi everyone, Elvin here from SG Enable. And uh, first, of, first of all, I just want to thank uh, Smart Nation Singapore for inviting me here today to share with you more about how can we enable persons with disabilities through the assistive technology. And of course, I would like to thank you as well for taking time off from your precious lunch time. I hope you have your drinks and your food ready. So while we uh, while you listen to me run through the whole presentation, and I certainly hope that this session here today, right, will fill your mind as much as you fill your food with your lunch, right? Okay, so um, just to, let's proceed on. So what I'm going to cover during this session itself, right, is to learn about what are the different types of assistive technology that's available to support the employees with disabilities at work. And you may be surprised, but actually nowadays there are even more mainstream technology, right, that can actually assist persons with disabilities. So we'll dive a little bit into that. And complementary to the use of assistive technology is about e-accessibility. And uh, by this, right, we will talk about the accessibility of the digital content such that employees with disabilities can actually uh, access the content. And last but not least, we will talk about workplace accommodation, where this is a deliberate effort by the employer to actually make the whole workplace a little bit more inclusive for persons with disabilities such that they can you know, use their assistive technology as well as the e-accessibility of content to be able to contribute to the work itself. So uh, the question I would like to ask you, maybe you answer for yourself is that, what do you want like, to walk away with at the end of this session? So you could be an inclusive employer, a would-be inclusive employer, you could be an employee with disabilities, or you, in general, you just work with a colleague with disability. Because regardless of who you are, I hope that this session will be able to answer your question along the way. Then if it doesn't, as what Emily mentioned earlier on, do throw in your questions in the Q&A, and towards the end, we'll try to answer the questions. Okay, so without further ado, let's uh, move into the first section, which is on assistive technology. Now, I'm not sure, uh, are you familiar with what assistive technology is? But this is the definition that we typically use, right? Uh, we, we adopt the, the definition from the United States uh, Assistive Technology Act, where assistive technology is basically any equipment, products, or services, right? That you can actually purchase and improve the functional capabilities of persons with disabilities. So for persons with disabilities, essentially they have lost a particular function. So what the assistive technology does is to lower the barriers such that they can resume fully or partially the, the capability that they have before, before this, the disability sets in. So I mean, a, a very common example is a wheelchair. So you have lost a, the ability to walk. A wheelchair actually still allows you to go from point A to point B, right? So that, that, that's, how, that's what we talk about assistive technology. But having said that, you might be thinking that, you know, is assistive technology something only for persons with disabilities? Now, uh, the answer is actually no. I cannot really see, oh, I mean, I cannot, I cannot see all of you now, but uh, actually, I'm pretty sure that many of us here are actually already using a piece of assistive technology, myself included. Any clues, right? Yeah, so actually it's the glasses, right? So back in the 13th century, Glasses is considered a piece of medical device. I mean, you can't you think about it. If I were to remove my glasses now, right, to be frank, I probably cannot even focus much on the screen itself. So in that sense, I'm considered a person with low vision, with some sort, with some sort of vision impairments. But yet, today, we don't see the glasses as a kind of a city technology. We see it as a lifestyle product. We see it as a necessity and for some, right? And even going forward, I mean, with the the development of smart glasses, I mean, there are quite a number out there. Uh, I mean, you know, the possibility is sort of, of endless. I mean, with the development of technology, right? There's no, there's no saying, no, what kind of capabilities that actually the technology can actually uh, provide for person disabilities. So just to, just to give you a sense of you know, how actually this technology can actually support, let's have a short video, right? Oh yeah, so that's the takeaway. So there's that, no, assistive technology is the enabler and we're all using it, not just persons with disabilities. So if there's anything you, you leave this uh, session with, do remember that no, assistive technology is for all. It benefits everyone, right? So as mentioned, let's have a quick look on how the technology advances right, can actually support a person with visual impairment. I've always been really passionate about human vision and what it is to see the world and how it feels really complex, but actually the brain sort of pieces together so much to make our sense of sight that technology like augmented reality can really play a huge role in people who don't have much in the way of light sensing ability. 
once you start to lose your sight, it really becomes difficult to differentiate between, say, a foreground object and a background one. They kind of blur together. We're making use of the sight that people still have, and it may just be the detection of light and movement or a small amount of shape detection. And so what we do is put that on the inside of a pair of glasses. This device is a large battery controller and processor, but the key thing is you've got these really simple controls, but the modes that we set were really what we're trying to investigate. So this is the simplest of all, so it just shows a depth map with a person or an object nearby is very, very bright. Then we can start to increase some of the details here by taking up one mode. So now the person now has a little bit of brighter outlines and there's a person revealed and some chairs behind it in the background. We also looked at some stuff where we'd also apply some cartoonization for anything that was near enough in front. So now we have one face here. It's quite pixelated, but you know, it can give you a gist of uh, there's a person there. And then there's another one where we just look at pure contrast. So this gives you a whole bright display and sort of boosts the contrast of objects. You can zoom in, magnify the image, you can pause it if you want. Because some people need to have that kind of ability to kind of pause an image and investigate a bit further. So it's really a huge range of stuff because blindness is such a diverse condition. It's really trying to suit the actual person's needs. Most of the people we work with... I'll just stop here in the interest of time. So as you can see, right? Technology has developed to a point where you will leverage on assist, uh, artificial intelligence you know, and all the various image processing kind of technology. There is actually potential to help the person with visual impairment in this case to really be able to see right, in, a, in a various sense. So, and this video in itself is slightly dated already. So, and actually there's the fair of development. I mean, even Apple has actually announced, a, 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 sorry, not Apple, I think it's Facebook. That's actually a, a, a announced a collaboration with, I think, Oakley to come up with classes. So going forward, a smart glass could be simply like what the glasses we see in, 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 I mean, that you are wearing now, right? And that is a tremendous uh, help for person vision impairment to be able to lower the barriers around them and be able to you know, participate in the society, right? Of course, uh, when it comes to assistive technology, actually there, there is a huge wide spectrum that we're talking about here. So some of you might be more familiar, familiar with the specialized kind of uh, assistive technology. So I mean, wheelchair is one example that we talk about there. So on the left here, I mean, we have some of the examples like the refreshable, refreshable Braille display that uh, actually, actually meant for support person with visual impairments, whether they're blind or below vision, to be able to uh, assess the digital content. And uh, somewhere in the middle, you have something like a high contrast large font keyboard. Again, it's meant for those with low vision. But uh, the, I mean, but you come and think of it, I mean, as we deteriorating, deteriorating eyesight, right? Actually having this high contrast and large font keyboard is actually, actually quite beneficial. That's why most people who will see this keyboard, I mean, share, share with me, right? And then, um, all the way to the right, we have virtual reality devices with high adjustable furniture. These are actually mainstream technology, mainstream products that if you actually you put it in a certain context, right, it can actually benefit person with disabilities, right? So in today's context, right, there is a huge spectrum. And which device to use, right, really depends on the needs of the person with disability as well as the budget. So maybe just to give an example of uh, mainstream technology, right? I'm pretty sure all of us here have our smart devices. In fact, some of you might even be viewing this Zoom on your smartphone or your tablets. So mainstream devices, right? Actually, technology is actually uh, adopting universal design to make it accessible to everyone. And if you look into your device now, right? Actually, there are, uh, chances are you see uh, there's an accessibility feature function, right? In your, in your system settings. And if you scroll through the options inside there, there are many, many inbuilt features, right? That are already supporting person with disabilities. I mean, if you ask a person with visual impairment or any person with disability for the matter, right? And ask them, what do you think about the smart devices? They will, they will tell you that it, actually this is like the best thing that happens to them. Because with such mainstream devices, right? Available to them at a, I would say fairly affordable cost. They are actually low, it lowers the communication barrier, it lowers the transport barrier, it lowers you know, all the various barriers, right? That actually allows them to work, live and play just like the rest of the community. So I mean, just a good, uh, just, I mean, the features below just show a few examples. I mean, you can use the tablet for communication, which in the case of the lady on the bottom left, you can use it to control the home appliances like in the middle. And uh, on the far right, you have a, a model who is an amputee as well. So with the 3D printed prosthetics, I mean, yeah, she can just perform anything else as, as per normal, right? So this is where all the mainstream technology actually comes in to make it, uh, to make a city technology more affordable for personal disabilities. And I would say that, one of the key reasons for that is mainly because of the mobile platform. I mean, we all, but by now, I think everyone is very familiar with the idea of um, apps and mobile platforms and app stores, etc. You know, so with the smart devices, right? Actually, all these, uh, these are all the various features that can actually very much uh, support a person's disability in 
uh, navigating their surroundings. And I mean, you don't need to take my word for it. I mean, cliche a bit, there's an app for that. So if you will come through the uh, app stores and the play store, you will find tons of mobile apps, right? That can actually benefit person with disabilities. Ranging from specially designed but paid, like the protocol to go on the left, which helps person who are non-verbal, to a inbuilt feature uh, within the uh, app, sorry, the phone itself, like left, left transcribe. Well, I, th I think it's changed name to uh, sound notifications now. So um, on the Android phone, it, it comes inbuilt with the Android phone. You can actually use it to just transcribe words. Like for example, what I'm speaking now, it becomes words. And of course, on the far right, you can uh, you can download apps. In this case, it's a free app actually from Microsoft or available on iOS. It actually helps person with uh, visual impairment to be able to read words around them, or in this case, even to identify notes. Right. So you. So uh, the beauty about the app store, I mean, the, the apps ecosystem is that there are many developers out there. Any one of them can actually develop an app. And anyone can just post it. I mean, of course, subscribe to the, uh, the rules and regulation of the various stores and put it up there and distribute immediately to person with disabilities around the whole world. Anyone can benefit. So imagine the, 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 how, how you can deliver impact just with an app itself. Right? So I, I think that's really the beauty of the, the smart devices platform right? that actually enables person with disabilities. Of course, beyond the smart devices, I mean, there are also other, as I, as I mentioned earlier, about high, just, uh, high adjustable table. These are actually mainstream uh, products and devices. But it's all about context. So now imagine for a wheelchair user, you know, you, if you've seen a power wheelchair before, right? I mean, there's a joystick that sticks out a little bit more. So if I were to sit ergonomically, it means that the table must be a certain height above, right, of the joystick. So with the height adjustable table, for many of us, we are more familiar with it as from the health angle, you know, that occasionally standing up is good for you. But for the power wheelchair users, right, it could be the way to make the whole workplace more ergonomic for them, right? So it's just about the context. And then on the right, you have the telepresence robot. I think, I think this is actually even impo more important in the past few years because of COVID, where everyone is locked down at home, right? And uh, telepre telepresence robot was meant out of the way for remote working, even before the COVID times. But again, it's about the context. What you see, the telepresence robot here, right? It's actually in the museum. So imagine if you are someone who is not able to go out of the home. With the use of the robot, you can actually still experience what it feels like to, let's say, explore a museum simply by controlling the robot. I think there was even, uh, I came across a use case where it was a library, I think. So the elderly was not, was not able to uh, go to the library easily. So they actually lock onto the robot, communicate with the librarian, went around the library to bring a book, and the librarian subsequently sent the book home to the, I mean, to that elderly's home. So these are some of the ways, right? I mean, you use mainstream technology in certain contexts, it can actually benefit person with disability in that sense, right? Yeah. So with that, I cover the assistive technology. So just to put it into certain contexts, let's speak the real people using the assistive technology, right? So we, who, who, I mean, over here, we have Ju Yang. Actually, Ju Yang is an is engineer with uh, GovTech, and uh, he has low vision, right? Because he can only see with right eye, and then sometimes you have to contend with blurred vision in the computer screens. But nonetheless, this is not going to stop him from performing his job. And I'll show you how he actually does it in his job itself. Right? Earlier on, you recall we mentioned about specialized and mainstream, I mean, the whole spectrum from specialized to uh, mainstream technology. So on the top right, you see JAWS. JAWS, this is a form of a specialized technology. It's a text to speech software, which essentially what it means, right, is that you, know, you actually read out everything on the screen. So you can actually navigate or understand the screen through sound alone, through audio alone, right? So that would be a very specialized uh, assistive technology. But at the same time, some of the issues right, can actually be very easily circumvented using mainstream technology. Monitor screen. If you, I mean, you, cannot, you need to zoom in to see uh, the words, that means you can see less, right? Simple. Let's have a bigger monitor screen, and that will allow you to see even more. Yeah, I mean, especially for Zhu Yang, he's a coder. So naturally, top left, you see all the codes. Yeah, it's, it's actually important to see the whole code all at one go, right? And then it will make the work much easier. So in, as you can see in this case, right, for Zhu Yang, right, he combines both specialized assistive technology and mainstream technology, and that allows him to do his work very well. In fact, I think uh, I think he joined as a uh, DevOps engineer. I think he has since promoted to senior DevOps, right? Des, uh, DevOps engineer. So as you can see, right, given the right tools, one can actually be able to contribute to his work and you know and perform just as well as any other employee, right? And again, this is a local example to see how it's been used, right? I mean, let's let's see a quick video 
on how this gentleman in Amazon actually does his programming work. I always got a thrill out of being independent, like just the, the feeling of being able to accomplish the same things that everyone else was accomplishing. I think people often underestimate me as a blind person and what I can do. People don't even know how can a blind person use a computer or use their phone or get around. They think, for example, that my dog does everything. I was born totally blind uh, when I was five years old. I started to lose my hearing, so I received cochlear implants. I'm a software engineer at Amazon. When people hear that, they're usually pretty surprised. They say, how do you do that? How do you write code when you can't see the screen? As far as how I do my job, I am using a standard laptop computer with a piece of software called a screen reader. It reads out the text on the screen. I can use the arrow keys, for example, hit the down arrow here, and it will read the next line. It is really, really amazing. I sometimes even forget he is blind. I expected to encounter more of being underestimated, but Amazon has really blown me away and like how great of an experience that I've had here. I think it's yeah, so I just stop here. So as you can see, right, given the right tools, even even though he's blind, right, he's able to actually perform his job as a coder. And if you hear the um, I'm not sure whether you caught it just now, the the very fast speech, of, wait, sorry, the very fast speech that comes up on the screen reader, this is exactly how they hear what's been spoken to them. So the I mean the running joke with my colleague who is also uses a screen reader right, is that she can actually finish the whole Harry Potter book, right? Hearing the whole Harry Potter series faster than I can read it, which could be true because I mean, I mean imagine they are listening to the to the words at five to ten times the rate at which we read the books. So yeah, so yeah, why not? With the correct tools, you can do anything, right? Okay, so um, just in case you are thinking that assistive technology is all about high tech stuff and everything, now maybe just let's, let's uh see this see the case of Ling Li, right? So she's an administrative assistant right at KK Hospital and. A kudos to them, right, for making a lot of accommodations to actually support her in her work. So for her, she uses mainly uses a motorized wheelchair, right? Uh, but uh, there are some other simple accommodations and simple tools that she uses, right, that can actually help her to perform in her work. So first and foremost, I mean, so firstly, I mean, she uses a standard computing device, so there's no need for uh, any further accommodations. But you no, know, some small little things is like having a table with a larger interior space, so as to accommodate the wheelchair. So again, going back to the earlier point, we talked about the um. The high adjustable table. So I mean, in lieu of that, having a suitable table that actually allows her to uh, sit comfortably on the table. If you notice the photo at the bottom, that's the joystick I'm talking about. So it's actually at a higher height. So if she's able to accommodate, well, then she's uh, in a very good position to continue with work. And the last point about the printer, actually I'll come, I'll come to this point later on when we talk about workplace of accommodation. But just to let me share since you are here. For Ling Li, right, when she first joined, her productivity was actually uh, affected in the sense because the typical printer that they use is on a shelf and it's of a certain a pretty big size. So in other words, right, from her wheelchair, she actually cannot reach the, the, the printouts. So every time there's a printout, she actually needs to actually ask her colleagues for help. And that's where the KKH comes in, right, to actually review and understand what, what, what was the challenge that prevents her from contributing to her work. And then realize that it's just a printer. So what do you do? You shift it down, put it beside the counter, and then problem solved. She's contributing just as well as the, any, any of her other colleagues at the, at the, at the, at the reception counter. So then some of these are the small little things, right? You know, they can actually, you can do, right? But actually the impact will be immensely felt, right? We'll come to that uh, a little bit more when we talk about workplace accommodation. Okay, so that wraps up the assistive technology part of things. I know I'm going, I'm going a little bit fast, so uh, please bear with me. Any, any questions, feel free to throw in the Q&A, and then I, you can, we can address that later on, right? And also at the end of it, I'll be showing my uh, contact details. So yep, yeah, feel free to email me anytime after that. Right? Okay, so let's uh, move on to the second section on e-accessibility. So earlier on, I talked about assistive technology, but even with the best assistive technology, right, you can't uh, reap the benefits of using it if the content that you're trying to access is not e-accessible. And this is where the e-accessibility comes in. So what do we mean by e-accessibility? Generally refer to the ease of use of information and and communication technologies, right? So, such an internet by personal disabilities. But of course, this is not limited to just internet. Your mobile apps, your um, digital kiosks, even down to the videos, I mean, the, the video screen and the MRT stations, right? These are all considered digital content that we should strive to make it e-accessible. And there, and there are many benefits from doing so, right? But uh, just to give you a flavor of what 
e-accessibility is about, I mean, this is, I mean, so these are the four categories of a person of disabilities, right? That generally we try to support through our work here. So for sensory, we're referring to both those with uh, visual impairment as well as those with deaf and hard of hearing. And then all of physical, intellectual, and autism. This, I think, should be fairly familiar to uh, all of us here. So now for every for every group, right, there are different e-accessibility considerations. But for some, but some of them are actually quite straightforward. You will actually will understand like some contrast, high contrast words naturally comes out easier. Everyone will be able, able to see better. And for low vision, this is particularly important. Right? And captions, of course. So uh, for persons who are deaf, having captions allows them to continue with conversation. Like even as I'm talking now, right, if you turn on the CC option in the in the, in the options, right, you actually get the closed captions. Okay, keyboard accessibility might be something new to you all, in the sense that what it essentially means, right, is that can I access this digital content using only the keyboard? I mean, many of us have been using mouse for a very long time. We are very dependent on it. Now try, if you don't use your mouse, can you still access the content? If you can, then yes, that content is actually a very accessible piece of content. So that's what we meant by keyboard accessibility. And for intellectual, naturally, we're talking about simple language, something easier to understand. And for autism, right, one of the issues is, uh, uh, it's more towards the sensory needs of a person with autism. So that's where we try to reduce the possibility of having any stimulus, right? Like for example, in this case, flashes and quick animation kind of thing, right? Or loud sounds, et cetera, bright colors. These are the stimulus that could potentially trigger meltdowns in a person with autism. So you know, a good design will actually take care of all this to ensure that the look and feel is actually comfortable. So as you can see, I mean, if each of them have different, different uh, needs. And just to put it a little bit into, uh, again, put it into context, I'll, I will play this video here. It's actually published by the W3C Web Accessibility Initiative. Okay, it's a seven minute long video. I'm not playing everything here, but I will strongly recommend that if you want to see e-accessibility e -accessibility in action, right? Do check out this uh this uh video. So I just run through the first one or two minutes of it. Web accessibility perspectives, video captions. Video isn't just about pictures, it's also about sound. Without the audio, you'd have to guess what this film is about. Frustrating, isn't it? Not knowing what's going on. That's the situation for everyone who can't hear. Captions make videos accessible. Which is also handy for people who want to watch video in loud environments. Or where you need to be very, very quiet. Colours with good contrast. There's something about great design that allows it to go practically unnoticed. But it doesn't take much to make things confusing and frustrating. Choosing colors with poor contrast makes navigating, reading, and interacting a real pain. Good design means sufficient contrast between foreground and background colors. That's not just text and images, but links, icons, and buttons. If it's important enough to be seen, then it needs to be clear. And this is essential for people with low contrast sensitivity, which becomes more common as we age. With good colors, websites and applications can be easier to use in more situations, like in different lighting conditions. Okay, I'll just stop here for now. So these are just by two of the various kind of uh, e-accessibility that actually we can sort of implement in the digital content that we have. And I'm sure everyone here will so I agree, right? I mean, having good contrast, it really helps you to, to read things. I mean, if you, you, have, you have tried reading some of the things in bright light, it's just going to be quite difficult. So we're having that good contrast, right? Actually, it really helps a lot. And there are many, 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 many more. So uh, I strongly recommend that you check out this video to see the rest, right? Okay, I think we're still doing good on time, 12.30, All right? Okay, so why is there a need for ESSPT? To be honest, I, I think in the past two years, I mean, two or three years, right, because of COVID, right? Actually, there's an increase, I mean, it, becomes, it becomes an increasing necessity, very easy to concern. Because, I mean, if you recall, at the onset of uh, uh, COVID, where everything is shut down, right, we start to move a lot of things online, whether it's transactions, content, you know, et cetera, learning, work from home, home based learning, et cetera. Everything goes online. However, when everything, but however, if the content that goes online is not accessible, right, it means that for persons with disability, they are not even access it. And what this means is that this is, it's, it's a gap. I mean, to us, it can be just a small gap, as you can see on the left, right? It can be a small gap, but for a person, for a person with disabilities, it, might, it must well be a huge chasm, right? That they need to jump over in order to be able to access the content. Hence, uh, we, 
in the last few years, I think we even see a CC even more than any to ensure that the content is accessible so that we don't leave the person with disabilities behind. So even though I'm talking about I me mean, from the perspective of a person with disability here, right? For some of you who are employers in this group here, there is also a, 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 I mean, there are also business cases as to why we should also push for e-accessibility. So firstly, I mean, having an e-accessible website, right? It means that you're actually extending your market reach. If you're, for some of you, if you're familiar with internet marketing, search engine optimization, etc., right? Actually implementing e-accessibility, right? But actually as a whole, make your digital content more accessible and more, uh, easy, I mean, easier to be picked up by the, search, the spiders and the search engine, etc. So that will actually increase your traffic, right? And the overall experience. But, uh, but more importantly, right, actually, if you think about it, your customers, your stakeholders, your visitors who use your website, right? When you make it accessible, it actually makes it easier for them to access. And we're not just talking about personal disabilities. You know, you can have elderly citizens, right? You know, uh, maybe they are more, they have different ability because of aging. Or in some cases, they are not even, uh, English is not their main language. So, they, so you, they, having a simpler website actually helps them to navigate the website better. Not to mention all those with temporary disabilities, you know, with a uh, slow internet. I mean, how, how many times have we, you know, just, uh, make make the website easier by not loading pictures and because of connectivity issues. But in case you you need a, a further push, right? I mean, this is a global number. So I mean, so based on the study, right? There is the the addressable market for person with disabilities and their caregivers. Don't forget the caregivers. I mean, the people take care of them because they will also need to put the devices, right? But we are we're looking at one trillion dollars. That's the that's the purple dollar they were talking about. I mean, if you search around. $1 trillion is the total accessible market globally for personal with disabilities. So imagine if your, your content can tap into this market, even within the Singapore context, right? That could be a sizable kind of uh, 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 market that you are not tapping into. So if you can actually look at the e-accessibility, you are providing yourself and a, a revenue source, you're providing options for the end users to be able to purchase things from you, right? So come think of it. So you can, can think a little bit about that. And the second case I'm talking about is more about brand enhancements. I think actually I would say that I mean this is even more relevant in the recent years because with the with the millennial workforce, right? If we read through some of the literature, the millennial workforce is also not they are looking beyond just the dollar and cents. I mean they are they want to make a difference in their life in their in the society, and hence they are looking out for companies that they can uh, align with. I mean yeah. So having that inclusive. Anger, right? It actually builds up the brand of the company as being a very caring and very inclusive kind of a company. And that in turn, right, attracts the talents who will be willing to join this company. So on the right, I actually have an example of Microsoft, which I which personally I mean I thought they, they, they did a really good job. Right? If you go back 20 years, most, I think most of us would think of Microsoft as yeah, a revenue uh, chasing kind of company focusing on the office suite, everyone must use, no internet explorer, etc. But 20 years down the road, I would say that they have sort of transformed. If you look into their products, right, they are, they are coming more from a user-centric angle. They want to ensure that their product can be used by anyone, right, whether the person with disabilities or not. And that, in terms, right, just transforms the image of the company from a revenue-chasing company to a customer-caring kind of, kind of a, a company. And needless to say, right, having this kind of image, right, will do good for not just the revenue as well, I mean, and, and also brings in the good people, as you mentioned earlier. Right? So they do the consider that in your equation. And of course, and thirdly, when we talk about the long-term cost savings. So um, if you design for accessibility from the start, right? I mean, later on when you you do there's, there's no need to you know, do some retrofitting or redesigning the website from scratch, should you then decide to uh, embark on the e-accessibility journey? So having it, if you consider from the start, from the design phase, right, in the longer run, it means that actually for more cost savings for you. But also the other important point is that. Having an accessible website, as we talked about earlier, right? We talked about having simpler interfaces, easier for people to digest content. That also means lower cooperation costs because chances are the people who come to your website to find things, they can find what they need. So in that sense, right? I mean, it sort of translates to less need for them to really approach, let's say, call, uh, call the hotline in that sense and takes up the manpower costs to actually address the issues. So in the long run, that's well, right? That also you reduce the manpower needs in your site. So all in all, having an accessible website we are actually um, yeah, happy to reduce the cost in the lower in the longer term. And last but not least, um, when we talk about adopting, accepting the ES, I mean, uh, implementing e-accessibility, right? It also drives into innovation because, again, the Apple, where Apple and uh, Google is concerned, right? I mean, they, they have many of their products actually um, <clears throat> actually designed by person with disability themselves, to be, to be honest, right? And that 
And when you, when you have person disability designing for themselves, right? That's where all the innovation comes in because to be honest, right? Person disabilities are actually one of the most innovative people in the world. And that is because of their own needs. When you have challenges, you will start, start thinking around, I mean, out of the box, etc. how you actually, actually design something that will meet my needs. And that's why they are actually one of the most innovation person. And having them in your organization, right? It also, it also means that that, could, that, will, that will trigger, will trigger down. I mean, you will spread osmosis, right? So you, as a whole, right, you're going to have a more innovative workforce. <clears throat> and that can't, can't be a bad thing, right? For any company, having a more innovative workforce for a more, uh, a more inclusive, a more uh, a, a culture, such as such it raises the morale of a company, definitely you'll you, 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 you do good for the company. So this is all, you know, all these are the four of the, I would say the key business cases, right? That we should drive or encourage you that you adopt e-accessibility. Right? So just to show you are, uh, what happens when you have e-accessibility in your products and services and you actually enable the person with disability with the necessary assistive technology. So over here, I'd like to introduce to you Christopher Hears. He's a video editor. No, but maybe, maybe I should not uh, <laughs> let you more. You see the video for yourself and then you see what, what happens when you have assistive technology and e accessibility coming together. Oops, sorry. So we did the video stop. Uh hi, I want to I Okay, I'll just stop here. So, yeah, so actually, actually Christopher here, I mean, this gentleman is, is incredible. I mean, we met him in person in Singapore before. And because okay, in this case, again, not, not that sign for you, but uh, in this case, right, because it, uh, the Apple ecosystem right, actually is quite well designed. So it allows him to actually use his devices and the e-accessibility features of the device itself, right, to actually allow him to do this. So actually, I noted there was, there was a Q&A question on uh, what are some of the products that actually Apple and Google has done, has created, right, to actually support personal disabilities. So actually, this is, I mean, this whole suite in itself, right? The, the inbuilt accessibility features underlying the operation systems of uh, Apple and Google, right? Are the ones that it will, be, it will be one key development that actually enables person with disabilities. And you can see for yourself, right? With, in this case, what having that system, having the ecosystem allows him to 
you know, uh, carry on his video editing business without any issues. In fact, you, I mean, if you see the gentleman at the start of this video, right, actually that was his father. <laughs> so he, actually he hires his father to help him to manage his business instead. So you can imagine, you see, you see how, the, how the thing turns around. So with the proper support, right, he can even run his own business. So that's, that's, the, that's why I see the potential right, in terms of technology to help person with disabilities. Right? Okay, so moving on, I will go to the last part of the, the, the key, the main context to talk about workplace accommodation. So we talk about assistive technology, we talk about uh, uh, e-accessibility. Now, for the person with disability to be able to leverage these two complement, the components, right, to be able to contribute effectively to their work, is where the employer could come in. And we talk about workplace accommodation to support them. And by that, right, I mean, we mean having that talk, having that uh, check-in, with the person with disability right, to understand what they need and then to subsequently to implement the accommodation to support them. So again, going back to the earlier example I mentioned about Lingli at the KKH, yeah, in the case, you no, know, just a matter of bringing down the printer, to put it by the side in, and well, settle. I mean, that, that settles the issue of uh, her having to ask her colleagues to, for help to, to take down the printer. So sometimes it can be very simple accommodation. It doesn't even need to be rocket science. So, but, so, but more importantly, really to have that conversation with the employee with disabilities and see how you know can uh, uh, support them in their work. Right? Okay, so um I talked about e-accessibility, but maybe just to rewind a little bit, I mean or rather go, go back a little bit, talk about accessibility in general. So in the workplace, right, when we talk about accessibility, it's really about uh putting in measures to support the person's disabilities on an equal basis, right, to actually be able to do all the work they need to do. I just want to highlight the, the word here, equal basis here. So for many of the person with disabilities, right, what they need is just to be able to contribute on an equal basis. They're not asking for special rights. They, what they ask is that all the barriers are lowered such that they can just contribute as by anyone else. So again, going back to uh, my favorite example of Lingli, right? All she needs to do is to be able to print and take the print out by herself, which is something her colleagues can do uh, when originally when the printer was on the, on the shelf. So by bringing it down, everyone can do it. So that in that sense, right, that's talking about accessibility. But of course, bringing down a printer is a very, is a very uh, easy accommodation. And... We don't, I mean, to be honest, we don't also don't expect you know, employers that have to try to cover every single needs of the person with disabilities right, in order to support them. And that's where we actually uh, are promoting reasonable accommodation rather than, you know, any, than, than a, a, all kinds of accommodation. Because it means that you, know, you just put in necessary and appropriate modification. So we, there shouldn't be an undue burden on the employers right, to actually provide the accommodation. And this is so that going back to the earlier point, this is where having a conversation with the employee is important. So we need to, both parties need to agree what is needed for the person to be, to be, uh, be able to contribute to his or her work. And having that understanding, right, and implementing the, the measures, right, it leads to a win for both parties where you have a talented staff who can actually contribute as well and you can actually um, uh, address the needs of the person with disability, right? So when so the workplace accommodations, right, is really about finding that balance first, of the of the two parts. So for accommodation, right, we're talking about meeting the specific needs of the, of the user. So in this case, I talk about screen magnifier because only the person with low, low vision needs the screen magnifier. So that will be accommodation. But accessibility, right, if you think about it, right, it's meant to meet the common needs of all users. So in those cases, it not only benefits the person with disability, it can actually benefit everyone as well. Automated sliding doors, I'm sure everyone would like that, right? <laughs> because also they save you the trouble of uh, using, having to open the door, close the door, etc. So having a good mix of accommodation and accessibility, you will actually be able to provide that inclusive environment that both your employees with disability as well as your employees without disability can both thrive in a common environment. Yeah, so this is what I mean by the reasonable accommodation. And of course, yeah, there are even more benefits from that. And it actually benefits everyone. So uh, one of the easy um, accommodation from the process point of view that I actually usually recommend, right, is that you know, there can be a flexible arrangements. Because uh, for personal with disabilities, right, especially wheelchair users and uh, those with visual impairment, it can be difficult for them to you non know, jostle with all the, uh, the, the, the peak hour crowds. So if you can actually allow them to come in later and leave later or, uh, or work from home kind of arrangements, right, you actually will ensure that they can still contribute without having to spend an unnecessary uh, effort, right, to actually, you know, to, to, to come into the office in that sense. Again, think about it, you having, you have that flexible arrangements that you extend to personal liberty, and then you extend it to parents of newborns, or those with an acquired disability who need some time to get into the new routine, you are actually sending a message that you care for your employees. And that in turn, right, leads to a more uh, high morale within the, within the company itself, 
and definitely you know, for those who are in HR here, right? I'm sure you helps in, in terms of the retention and you know, having that good uh, image of the company itself. So in this sense, it actually benefits everyone. And the second point I'm talking, talking about enabling all employees to perform essential job functions. Later on, we talk about equal rights, right? I mean, equal needs, equal basis. So by uh, providing uh, the workplace accommodation, right, you can ensure that all employees, you're not, you're not dis uh, disadvantaging any one group over the other group in that sense. So you yeah, enable all to perform essential job functions. And the last point is actually why we why I covered a little bit earlier on in terms of business cases. Um, a stronger corporate image, as I say, right, means you attract more talents. I mean, especially with, with, with the millennial, millennial workforce today, that is very, really, very really important. Having the correct image from bring them in. Right? Okay, so uh, with this, right, these, 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 these are the importance and why we should put in workplace accommodation for person disabilities. Okay, so with this, right, uh, yeah, so for those who by now, for the, especially for the employers, right, by now, right, if you're, and also employees with disabilities who are keen to, you know, join the workforce, etc. If you're already ready to take the next step, I just want to share uh, some of the uh, work that actually Enable does that actually we can support you. So for actually Enable, when we, started, when we first started, the focus was very much on employment for persons with disabilities. Uh, but since we have since evolved to cover all things disability, but where employment is concerned, right, I mean, we are, we are here, we are supporting the employers who are, who are keen to employ persons with disabilities, and we are also supporting the employees, uh, all the, starting all the way from their IHL days or their special school days, right? So actually looking to supporting them to, to transit them into the workforce. And of course, for those who are ready to, to, to take the next step and know they're employed, we have grants, we have support, we have various kinds of uh, uh, tools, right? To actually to support you in that hiring process. And of course, for those who have already done it, thank you very much. And we'd like to uh, recognize your efforts. And this, we have, this is why we have an enabling mark launched by President in 2020. And it's meant to uh, recognize or credit the uh, companies, right? They are inclusive. And in case you're ready to jump without waiting for me to complete this session, <laughs> feel free to scan the QR code over there. It actually brings you to our em the employment page on the SG Enable website, where you can actually see for yourself all the various tools and uh, resources right that you can leverage on to be an inclusive employer. And, on the, and this is not just for the employer side. Employees as well, right? You can see for yourself what are the things that we can actually support you with, or what you can bring back to your employer to look into. I mean, for example, you, employ, you might need a certain piece of assistive technology, which can be fairly expensive. Uh, but you ho you're hoping your company could purchase it for you, but they didn't know that actually there's an open door for rent, which is a grant that we administer right, to support you. So in those cases, you can bring it back to the company and hopefully it works out for everyone. Okay, and uh, in, if you'd like to understand more about inclusive employers, uh, actually this is where I'd like to share a piece of information with you. And I believe it's actually one of the questions asked in the Q&A about, um, let me see. Local examples of local companies in terms of inclusive companies, right? So I think this is in the case uh, for this person who asked, uh, yeah, I think you might be interested to join this session, the Inclusive Business Forum coming on the 25th August, where we invited uh, DPM, Mr. Lawrence Wong, to be the guest of honor. And at this session, right, you will hear from him and you will hear from the other inclusive employers of their journey in terms of employing person disabilities. And you have seen the companies on the right over there. So if you're interested in, um, you know, uh, disability inclusion, right, and how it actually supports in terms of your business resilience as well as your sustainable development for the future, right? I think this is the event to go to. Do look out for it. If you're interested, do go and sign as well, right? And then, and then you can find out for, more for yourself how others have done it and how you can do it in the future. Okay, so with that, uh, that's my that's my last content. Mainly my, well, that's my main last content. So just want to finish up the presentation with a short video. And we see all, everything coming together. You have assistive technology, you have workplace accommodation, you have ESB all coming together. And this is how this actually enables this gentleman to be able to work at the Sharia Court. Right? Enjoy. My name is Mohan Fidel Sarifi. I'm working currently in uh, Sharia Court. I handle the counter, serving the clients, normal general inquiries, uh, doing of collections of documents, and also applications. Lah. I actually didn't manage to get any um, jobs uh, for about six months due to my condition pro probably lah. after uh, getting to know that SG Neighbor can uh, assist me in uh, uh, searching for jobs I actually approached them lah. Uh, you know finally I have something that I can work with and also even better uh, a new experience because I have not done counter service before lah. accommodation given to me uh, uh, assistive devices, for example, the uh, CCTV whereby it can magnify for me the documents that I'm reading. 
so it will be more efficient in my work and also the software so that I can um, zoom to a, a certain area in my monitor that I want to read. It comes with the keyboard lah, whereby it's bigger and uh, faster for me to type as well. I would say my strengths would be being systematic and also a fast learner lah. So when somebody actually uh, tell me these are the processes, I will follow exactly the same and it's more efficient for the future. I would advise to keep continue uh, trying to look for a job because there's always an opportunity uh, somewhere for us. Lah. I also would like to encourage employers to uh, give a chance to people with disabilities uh, who are eager and excited to fulfill uh, the needs of or requirements of the organization. Lah. Okay, so just can stop here, my logo. <laughs> yeah, so I just leave the, the, the boring part to the last. Lah. So, I mean, uh, earlier on, I, mean, I, I didn't share much about Azure Enable. So, just want to give a quick overview of what Azure Enable is about. So, basically, as I mentioned, right, we are a focal agency for disabilities. So, the whole idea is that we want to have enable persons with disabilities right, to live, learn, and work and play in the inclusive society. So, we are set up by MSF back in 2013. And we are a charity, we are IPC. And so, should you have any questions regarding disability and inclusion? Come and find us. I mean, the website is there. You can easily search for us online. We we'll always be an email or call away. So, uh, I, I believe that based on the Q&A, Q &A, I see, I think we we'll, uh, should be talking to a few of you after this. So, feel free to contact, right? And uh, just in case you are interested more on in the technical part of things, we have the TechAble web app. Right? So, uh, TechAble is actually a center for assistive technology based in the Enabling Village in Red Hill area. So, if you're interested in assistive technology, this is a place to go to. If you don't come down to the physical center, this is the online portion of it, where you can actually find out more about the various kind of assistive technology devices that can help persons with disabilities, right? And lastly, we have my contact videos, right? So thank you very much. I hope this session has been very useful for you. I've covered assistive technology, I've covered e-accessibility, I've covered workplace accommodation. And I think this is just a start of a conversation with many of you over here. So do feel free to contact me, uh, um, email, etc. And we can actually have a, we can always have a conversation on later on. In fact, I think, uh, don't mind if I just read some of the uh, Q&A as of now, because I think uh, I think there's someone from People's Association. You mentioned that you uh, like to talk on AT and can conduct in Chinese. These are the things I mean, I, I, I can, I think I should be able to, to be honest, I haven't done it, <laughs> but I should be able to conduct it in Chinese if necessary. So do write to me and I'll follow up with you on that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, um, oh, sorry, I think uh, Lei Ting was asking about QR code. I'm not sure which one you're referring to, but if you're talking about the tech level one, it's the one on this page as well. Okay, right. So um, I think there's a question about are there good websites or builders or templates that you can recommend to develop a site for e-accessibility? Um, to be honest, I'm not sure which, which what would be the best website, but I did hear that um Wix, W I X, I think it's a it's a it's a template building kind of a website, right? And quite a number of the features, I mean the, the design is such that I think it's fairly accessible from the start. So if you need to explore, right, you can try. You can try with that website first, wix.com. And uh, but for folks, I mean, some of the uh, uh, some of the platforms out there, right? From what I understand, they have accessibility in place, especially those are, that are US based, because in, in the states, right, there is a need. I mean, by, mandated by legislation that they the website has to be accessible. Hence, many of the websites designed in the US, right? Chances are they're going to be accessible from the onset. So if you need be, right, you can consider looking for those as well. Um, often I can remember, um, WordPress. By default, right, the underlying engines are actually uh, fairly accessible. So if you don't need, if you don't need a very sophisticated website, you need a block, block kind of a website. WordPress could actually could potentially suffice you know, to to meet to meet your needs. Otherwise, I think Wix.com is what is one of the websites I heard of before, right? Okay, so then um, examples. Okay, again, going back to the to the the point about products by Apple and Google that has been designed by person with disabilities. Okay, this, at this point, maybe I'd like to highlight. Uh, seeing AI, if you recall one of my slides, right? I talked about an app called Seeing AI, S E E I N G AI. Okay, this is a the app developed by Microsoft and only available on iOS. But if you so, if an iOS user, I encourage you to try it out for yourself because it's really that that is actually designed by a blind programmer in Microsoft back then, and it's tremendous. It's good. You mean you it does optical character recognition, you, you just you just point at any text, any printed text that you see, right? It actually be able to uh uh, 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 recognize the words that speak out to you. 
And actually, they, they can even take a photo of someone and describe to you who is that person in front of you. And there's a visual on, there's a feature in, I think it's in beta form now, it's uh, for handwriting. And I tried for myself, actually, it's still, fairly, it's still fairly accurate. So even down to the handwriting, you can, you can actually sort of like take a photo of it and actually trans, transform it into a digital content that actually a person who is blind can actually consume. So I mean, to me, to me, that's really one of the best, uh, I mean, ever I've seen before. Um, another one that comes to mind, let me think, let me think. Uh, all cam, there's this the attachment to a, to a glasses, right? But it's, it's by Israeli company. That when you take it on, it performs the same similar function as seeing AI, which allows you to actually detect who's in front of you. Actually, uh, you can actually, uh, you, you can train it to recognize faces. Like for example, if you, um, if you store the face of your, let's say your, your spouse, right? In your, in your, in, in your, in your, in your specs. I mean, when you turn on the all camera, it can actually tell you that your spouse is in front of you. It's like that the level. Again, it's by a blind, uh, I think developer, some innovator within the company itself from Israel. So these are some of the examples I can think of. Um, if I go, it's just something interesting. I mean, if I go back to history, right? Email and typewriter, you'd be surprised. These two technology that we take for granted today, right? Are actually originally designed for person disabilities, but somewhat by person disabilities, right? Uh, yeah, for person disabilities. So even things like this, right? Take for granted, actually, they are actually designed by person disabilities. So if really we really go if you're going to go and study this, right? You will find a lot of innovations coming up for person disability. So I mean, often these are few that, that I can recall in my head. I mean, I might come across, I mean, I might suggest more later on <laughs> if, I, if I remember, but I hope this has actually answered some of the questions. Okay, then um examples of inclusive companies while local companies are that uh, answered already. Do uh, check out the uh, inclusive business forum if you're interested to find out how the other companies have done it locally. Okay, uh, next question. Can we visit Enabling Village with our members and residents to see the various devices? Yeah, sure. So you're talking about, you're talking about devices, right? Tech Able is the place to go. So we are open to public. Okay, on that note, maybe I can just switch back to my earlier slide. Right. So for Tech Able, right? Uh, I mean, we are open on the normal office hours, uh, excluding lunchtime and uh, non-public holidays. So, but if you are coming out in a group, right, I would strongly recommend that you contact us so that we can uh, know, so they can expect you when to come and ensure that we have staff on hand, right, to actually be able to guide you around if necessary. So yeah, if not, walking is, walking is welcome. Feel free to drop by anytime, right, in the neighboring village. Okay, uh, next question. I attended, I've attended a Zoom interview and supposed to identify the color of liquid, but it is too small and wasn't able to see the image very clearly. Requested to say on site and view the liquid, but the HR said they don't arrange for that. Okay, I mean, I'm not sure when this happened, but if it's during the, the at the height of the pandemic, right? Um, I mean, that could, it, could, it could arise from safety reasons, but I mean, I, I'm not speaking on behalf of that, of that uh, organization. So, uh, well, no. Let's hope things will change. I mean, hopefully you have a chance with, with that with the organization. If not, I mean, probably you can give that feedback to the organization and hopefully, you know, hopefully, hopefully things will change, right? To be, to be honest, where disability uh, inclusion in companies is concerned, right? I think Singapore, we are moving. But of course, if you want to compare with some other countries, right, we are still far away. But definitely, we are progressing. So, give us some, give, give us and give everyone some time. Maybe in the next few years, right, we're going to see more and more inclusive efforts. Right. Uh, hopefully, we can introduce more people to the inclusive business forum, right, to actually uh highlight their efforts. I mean, we also have DPN coming in already, so I think that's a very strong, I mean, that's a very encouraging point that we see to uh support inclusive uh employment. And hopefully, we'll see more. Right. So let's work towards that. Oh, sorry, uh, the last question about the OrCam is uh, O-R-C-A-M. O-R-C-A-M. It's actually from Israel. So, yeah, you search for, yeah, that you get it. Right, okay. Um, let's see. Well, someone's asking, asking a question about ATF, assistive, uh, so for, for those who are not familiar, it's called the Assistive Technology Fund. So, uh, can the VR and the modified ergonomic tables be applied through ATF? So okay, this no, no, I just want to share a little bit in terms of processes where assistive technology is concerned. Uh, sorry, where the assistive technology fund is concerned, we accept the sub applications from therapists and social workers. So the first step, right, is that there must be a therapist who is subscribing those products for the individual. So if if, if, there, if there's a therapist that says that yes, I will subscribe this VR gear to this individual because it's essential for his or her independence at home, for example. Then yes, this application comes in, my colleagues in the ATF team, they will perform due diligence and look to it. So the first step is having that, that 
uh, assessment for the individual, right, to understand what are some of the uh, assistive technology that they can use, and then subsequently to submit the application. The therapists and the social workers will be will be fam will be familiar with this, so do talk, do talk to them. Okay, and the last one, uh, the next one about can actually enable support people who have low vision but not qualify as PWD. Uh, generally, yes, because I mean, if you come by the table and give you that consultancy, give the advice, that's 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 what you can do there. Uh, the the only issue is I mean, uh, when it comes to the financial schemes, because uh, unfortunately we need we need certified proof that is a person with disability, right? So uh, for some for some of the schemes, but otherwise advice consultancy, you know, definitely we're more than happy to share. So you can actually get uh, you can actually uh, come by to or even email in. I mean, we're more than happy to talk, right? Okay, so yeah, I think I'm done with the questions here.